If you are a designer and you plan on making this a very serious career for yourself, this is the video for you. I am going to have a deep dive conversation with legendary designer, Emmy award-winning designer, the person who oversaw projects for the likes of Justin Timberlake, Coldplay, Gnarls Barkley, and even Xbox and Microsoft. Walk us through the three fundamental skills that designers must have to go from good to great. You wanna stick around for this three-part masterclass series. Okay, Chris, you've been in the design space going on 30 years now. I think you have trained many designers under you and you've seen the differentiators between someone who's really great at their craft and someone who, for lack of a better term, is mediocre and needs some work. So I wanna just microscope in on the three skills that you think every person who desires to become world-class designer should master. And let's start with kind of the first one that comes to mind for you. I'm glad that we're having this conversation, Mo, because I get criticized a lot about talking about the business, about pricing, selling, and negotiation that they think, oh my God, you're just trying to tell a bunch of lame second, third rate creatives on how to go get more money. And that, for whatever reason, is bothering people. First, I just want to address that. If someone is lower tier and to make more money than you, maybe that's a signal that you need to learn more sales skills or marketing skills. Because this is a good thing. When when people with less skill than you are making more money than you, it should lift the entire industry up. Because the inverse is not good for industry. They're pulling the prices down. So I think instead of sending me hate mail, you guys should send me love letters. I really think that. But let's get into it. So the presumption is you have some fundamental skills that like you know the tools, either through self-taught, uh, being self-taught, or you've taken courses or you've interned somewhere where you have some basic skills, you know how to put things together. So let me start off, and this is not in any particular order. The first skill that I think is going to be a game changer, it's kind of counterintuitive, is to develop great listening skills. And this is like, why do you need to be a good listener to be a good designer? Is it designing about expression and making things? Most of us who know how to create things can create anything. And although we desire the open creative brief where they say anything you make will love, we think there's this fantasy in our mind that we just get to make whatever we want and people will give us money and in some instances that's true when you ascend yourself to a state of being an artist or an artisan or something like that and you have a clearly distinctive style people will just give you money to do more of the same that's both good and bad this is a long-standing practice within photographers and illustrators or image makers because they want to be known for a specific style so when you hire me you get my style the only problem is when that style goes out of style and all styles go in and out, what are you going to do? Now you wish people would give you the opportunity to do a different style, kind of complicated. Or sometimes you get bored of your own style. It's like you can't do something else because they won't like it. It's so now you're stuck doing the same thing over and over and over again, even though you've personally moved on aesthetically. So what I want to do is to say, look, yes, you're capable. You can do anything. So the real question is, what should you be doing? Not how you should be doing it. So the only way I know how to do that is to engage with the client, wherever it's giving you money, through a series of questions and listening with open ears, not with happy ears. Happy ears are like listening for whatever you want to hear for and then kind of morphing that into whatever it is you think you heard. And we see this happening all the time because as the expression goes, it's easier to hit a target once you know where the target lives. Something that I learned from my business coach, Pierre McLaren, is you don't need to tell me where the bullseye is. You just need to tell me what wall facing because oftentimes we're looking in the north direction and the bullseye is on the south wall so i need to be oriented in the right direction and the only way i know how to do that is by asking the clients questions so when he said that to me i was like wow this is amazing because now i can start to design a series of questions and reduce the number of options down hence orienting myself towards the wall in which the bullseye is on and then it takes away a lot of stress so i want to replace design exploration with questions and words and dialogue. And so instead of toiling hours, days, or weeks on a, on a concept that may not work, and then to feel super frustrated when the clients say, this isn't working, this is not what we expected, which is heartbreaking for any creative, I want to begin the conversation with dialogue by asking questions and then just being really silent and being very still and just listening. Mo, what do you think about what I just said? I agree with it, but I gotta ask on behalf of the audience, Chris Doe can do that. Chris Doe can go into a meeting, listen really well, take solid notes, 
ask clarifying questions. But what if I'm the designer who needs the job and I ask all these questions and then the answers become something that I can't do? What do I do then? Okay, there's two things that you brought up. Your primary question and your other question, which is a lot of people think I need the job. And if I ask the client too many questions, won't that signal to them I do not know what I'm doing? Won't that be annoying and won't that drive or push them away? And in fact, nothing could be farther from the truth. I know you can find so many examples in your real life. When you walk in as a buyer, as a consumer, of something unsure of what it is you're buying either a product or service and the person actually spends time talking to you to assess your needs your budget your timing and other things that normal salespeople don't even bother to ask what happens then is you build rapport and it and a personal connection with this person thinking they really care whether they do or not that's the feeling that you have you might come in and say i need a certain car and then they go through a series of questions diagnostic questions to help you understand like you're better off trading in this car for this and buying a used car and you'll get more bang for the buck and has a higher resale value. And so you're building a relationship with people. So many creatives, myself, especially in the beginning of my career, I was afraid to ask questions thinking, who am I to be asking them these questions? And won't that signal to them I'm an idiot and I don't know what I'm doing? But in fact, it's the thing that gets you the consideration for the job. Of course, you still have to have the talent and the skill. It can't just all be cotton candy, puffs of something that you can't bite down on. Hey, before we go too far, I just have a really simple ask. I'm not here to sell you anything. But it would mean a lot to us just to help with the algorithm and how it runs to leave a comment right now. You can type in what city you're from, type in your name, type in anything. It'll help other people find this video. And if you're truly getting value, don't forget to subscribe. So that leads me to your primary question, which is, I need this job. What if I ask him certain questions and I can't do it? On the surface, it seems like a really legitimate question, right? But let me just ask you this. What if you proceed on a job where there's nothing that you can do that will satisfy the client? Aren't you better off knowing that upfront versus later on? Because that sounds like some form of torture. <laughs> Mo. Like you're a hip hop guy. You can freestyle battle rap. There's a lot of skills that you have. I'm not saying that you can't do it, but what if I wanted you to compose a country song that is a mix between opera and country, right? And you didn't know that that's what I wanted. So you're coming at me with like heavy beats, super dope lyrics, and you keep showing me option after option. And I keep telling you that ain't it, that ain't it. I'll know when I see it. And eventually I yo bro, what's up? And, and I say to you as a client, you know what's up? You're fired. I'm not gonna pay you. <laughs> I'm gonna give you a really bad review because you just wasted a lot of my time. So now you've wasted time, energy, and goodwill when you know you could not have come up with a solution that the clients would be happy with. So that fear, that fear of like, what if they say something I can't do? Well, that's good news to find out early on. To say like, you know what? Based on what you said, here's what I heard. I heard you say this, this, and that. And I don't think I'm the right fit. Here's something that's cool that's gonna happen. The person's gonna say, oh, thank you for the honesty. Very few people would say that. But you know what? I have a good feeling about you. Tell me what you would do instead that you can do, or can you hire other people to help you? I'm just intrigued because of the rapport we've built that I wanna to continue down this path because I think someone else would just assume what it is that I want. Now what you've done is you've spoken about the elephant in the room, which is, I don't think I'm a good fit. You've taken one step backwards, you've retreated. And if they're like, you know what, we really like you, they're advancing, they're pursuing you now and you're not pursuing them. It's a classic principle in the win without pitching manifesto, right? You're doing something really good there and you're being really honest and ethical about how you do this. So now they've given you permission to go work with other people. They've also changed their expectations about what you can and cannot do and they're yes. opening their mind to like what else is there. And if they just simply say, you know, I appreciate your honesty, I'm gonna go look somewhere else. You've saved yourself some massive heartache and potentially you planted a seed for a future relationship with this person who may very well come back to you and say, you know what? I love your honesty so much that I'm gonna give you another shot at a different project that I hope you'll feel like you can do. I really wish that whoever is listening to this replays that last two to three minutes because I've done personally exactly what Chris has said about retreating and then seeing them advance just from a place of honesty. And I wish for everybody to be able to experience that. Once you lean in with courage to be able to tell yourself with integrity that this is not something that you can do, you'll be amazed at how the client just looks for a way to work together or completely changes the scope. And I think like having learned this from you, Chris, the position that you put yourself in, even if you don't work together, you're on their vendor list. 
just from like your honesty for whenever they need something that you can do. I now really understand what you were talking about when we would do role plays that are super aggressive. And you'd be like, Mo, the clients that I've worked with, they don't even push against me like that. So I'm, I'm foreign to this experience. What I've learned with high caliber clients is when you're listening and asking thought provoking questions, they're also listening to your line of questioning to determine your level of expertise in what you do. And they're deciphering, is this person really what they say they're about? Does this person and really know the scope of what a project like this would take based on the line of questioning, based on how they're trying to filter me of being a client or bring me in as a client. The second thing they're trying to do is understand if you can actually help them. I remember a client saying this to me like after we had worked together for a while, he was like, that first discovery call, I saw your work, but I wanted to know if you could help me. And a lot of times that listening and that line of questioning is, it's a dance of like, they're on show for you as like, can you take them on as a client? And you're on show for them if like you can actually help them. And it's really interesting how that happens from less talking and more question asking and retreating whenever you're not a good fit. So I really hope that people can experience that and lean into doing what you're telling them to do because it's a very liberating thing to experience. I just wanted to add some context to my personal experience when that came up. Do you have anything else to add around this number one or do you think it's safe to move into the second one? You know, I have everything to add to this. So. <laughs> Go let ahead. me let me make a metaphor that everybody can understand, I think. Let's just talk about relationships, right? You're at an event, a party, you're a single person, you're out to meet somebody that might be a long-term relationship for you. And you see lots of attractive people. This works whatever gender you are. And attractiveness is what gets you considered. Now you can consider your portfolio, your body of work, your reel, all that kind of stuff as your level of attractiveness, okay? But what's going to seal the deal? When you meet this person, they can say things like, I'm more interested in learning about you versus talking about themselves versus trying to sell you on how great and accomplished they are. And if you're anywhere kind of more mature in your life, you're, you're already way tired of those people, whether it's men or women, it doesn't really matter. You're like, you know what? I've, I've had this experience before. I'm not interested in you just sucking up all the energy. But the person who winds up being the most interesting person is the person who's most interested. They're interested in you. They want to ask questions. They want to learn about what your needs and wants are and when appropriate, they might say a thing or two. And it's, it goes down to this fundamental thing. Everybody wants to talk about themselves. Facts. So if you want to be more attractive, to other people, ask people genuine questions about what they're looking for, and then just be willing to listen. Now, I wanna tell a story to put this like into super concrete example. Okay, this is a real story, this is real life. I've worked in advertising and broadcast design for over two decades. Unfortunately, as the industry evolved and there were more people, more suppliers, and there were demand for the work, we got into this thing where the whole industry became highly competitive and was pitch-based. So you only win projects based on your ability to pitch. So being fairly new to this, I hated the pitch process. We were doing work for free in hopes of getting work. It's a horrible practice, but that's how the industry evolved into, unfortunately. So in the beginning, we'd get on the phone, we'd talk to them, they would tell us the, the script, the idea, the creative brief, and then we would go away and with a team of five to 10 people, we would work on multiple ideas. Wow. The reason why we did that was because we didn't have a clear idea ourselves as to what might work. We let the clients use broad language. They use suitcase words, words that have many meanings depending on who's asking. And we just did that. And that's how we thought we were supposed to pitch. So instead of walking in with a few ideas, we'd walk in with volume. It was tonnage. We would overwhelm the clients with so much exploration and so many different possibilities. And we thought, well, that's a competitive advantage. They're gonna be blown away by old ideas. Now, you know this, Mo, we start to create the paradox of choice. You ever go eat a cheesecake factory? It takes exponentially longer at Cheesecake Factory to pick what you want because the menu is like 10 pages deep. You're not worried that you're you're gonna have a bad meal. You're worried that you're not gonna have the best meal. So yes. you're like, maybe I want the chicken cacciatore, I want the pizza, I want the Caesar salad. I don't know what I want. And so naturally it takes you a really long time to go through this. If you ever watched an episode of Kitchen Nightmares, the first thing that Gordon Ramsay does is he chops that menu down to nothing because what you can do is you can make a few excellent dishes and allow the clients to pick one or two things that it's going to be a really amazing experience and so we would pitch this way for many years until we learn that if we just ask better questions and we listen the amount of exploration like say we're gonna explore 10 ideas becomes two sometimes just one and we tell the clients we actually have a very clear idea as to what you what you want we would say it in words and describe it and say is that what you're thinking do we have this correct and they're like, yes, and that's it. Now, imagine if we had the same 10 people that were gonna work on the project, work on 10 different ideas, we get them to work on one idea. Oh, so yeah. instead of going a mile yeah. wide, we go a mile deep. So now we can get into very specific ways in which each frame is going to look, 
the story, the conceptual development is really tight. And then we say that we might lose, but we have a better shot of clearly articulating our vision for what it is that we're going to do, that the yes. clients then have one decision to make, not 10. The one decision they have to make is, is this what we want? If it is, we got the job. And we saw something quite remarkable happen. Our win rate went up, our expenses went way down, we required fewer people to work on it, and it reduced the amount of burnout that people were feeling. Because when you pitch on a job, then you don't win time and time again. It's demoralizing, and it feels like it's a waste of money, time, energy, effort, and artistic capability. So that's a really concrete example of how when we ask the right questions, that we listen, and we focus our energy on doing less but better, everything works out better. If you found that listening and asking really great questions is a skill you want to dive deeper on, watch this video.